It's the first time I've ever seen a lieutenant not have a question. Welcome back to the team room, everybody. It's Trent, it's me, and it's Lieutenant Pops with us today, an MQ-9 driver currently with a whole bunch of a backstory uh, that we'd love to fill you in on. For right now, everybody, please like, subscribe, hit that, hit that notification bell while you're sitting here and you got two seconds to hear me babble on before we hop into this juicy podcast. Make sure you're supporting us wherever we are. Go over to onesready.com, check that bad boy out and anywhere that you can download your podcast. And if you leave a review, that would be super tight. Don't be funny on the review. Just just say something nice and give us five stars and be on your way. It's free. That'd be great. Without further ado, okay. William, Pops, Lieutenant, Prior, Mustang dude. What's up, man? Welcome to the team room. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. My kids will think I'm famous that I'm on something that started with uh, like and subscribe. So they're very excited. There you go. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we found out, so we looked at our analytics, right? And, you know, YouTube has this problem. Everybody has this problem. About 70% of the people that listen to us, like religiously, you can see 70% aren't subscribed. And people hit us up. They're like, wow, we can't believe you guys aren't more popular. We're like, well, yeah, it's because you listen to it and you're not subscribed. Could you help us out? But that's how it works. Enough about us. So we wanted to bring you on because you have a couple of things that we talk about all the time here. And we, we speak about it specifically for aspect war, but we sort of open that, that aperture up. So take us back young William Miller before pops, before the enlistment, you know, where, how did you find yourself to the air force? Uh, so it was, I enlisted in December of 2005, I was 23 then. So a bit of a late enlister right off the bat. Really bumming around. I, I was a bit of a scumbag. I wasn't doing anything. I was living in Jacksonville, Florida. Not doing That's a good anything place for scumbags, though. Jacksonville, yes. when you're like a bit of a scumbag, I was like, okay, where in Florida? Yeah, Jacksonville is a good place. Yeah, I mean, I had a lot of fun as a scumbag. But wasn't doing anything. No real progress. My father had been in the Army. Uh, 2005 was a pretty busy time for all the military. And... Uh, he was pushing me to, if you're not going to do anything, then uh, or if you are looking to go into the military, the Air Force is the best one, knowing the quality of life, knowing, uh, I think, a little bit at that point, looking back at what his motivations might have been, I think he probably didn't want me to get shot. So he was like, sure, the Air Force is, you know, especially a non-combat job in the Air Force is probably going to keep my boys safe. Um, so went looking to the recruiters. Uh, wanted to and i wanted to see the world and meet girls uh that was the priority at the time yeah what if i tell you the dudes never come okay you yeah. think you're gonna have all this fun you look or you know the girls never show up you look around you see all these all these dudes yeah. and you're like man we're gonna yeah. we're gonna meet so many chicks and then the chicks never show up to the party and it's just you and your bros piles of dudes yeah. piles lots of dudes, of dudes. <laughs> so, lots of hot dudes though yeah no there's been some there's been some Eights and nines and a couple tens of dudes. But nice, good for uh, you, bud. Yeah. So uh, I had some waivers that I had to come in with, and the, the Air Force at that time wasn't really looking for anybody. The the Army was looking for people. The Marines really wanted people. Uh, I was a bit thicker at the time, and the Air Force said, "You know, we're doing fine. We don't really, uh, we're not recruiting heavily." I had to go and lose a bunch of weight and uh, to convince them to come in, and I had to come in open general. What's that? Was that a pun? They weren't recruiting heavily? Sorry. That's good. <laughs> there's one people that you're still allowed to make fun of in this world, and it's fat people. You have, there's no problem with fat shaming. It's not even a thing. There's not even a word for it. Yeah. They, uh, they did take me, though. They They... They did take me. I went in open general, so I got my job at tech school. Uh, so I, I go to Lackland. I didn't know, uh, or no, I went open mechanical. It wasn't open general. It was open mechanical. Uh, so at that time, you sat in basic. They filled we filled out some papers. We did get recruitment from uh, the special warfare guys. I think it went a different time, uh, name at that time. None of that was interesting to me at all at, at that moment in uh, in my career. But I chose aerospace. I think it was called Aerospace Engineers, the AFS, AFSC. And I thought I was going to work on spaceships. So that's how <laughs> smart I was at the time. Yeah. I thought that, well, that meant first that of I all, was going to work on a space shuttle. 
I, I, you know, you can tell people whatever you want. Like nobody can fact check it. You can just, all you have to do is be like, I work on space shuttles and be like, where at? And then all you have to say is data mask. And then people aren't allowed to ask. Yeah. It's in the Geneva conventions. I do want to kind of pull this, this thread here though, is like you had the brief from AFSPEC war and you had zero interest to do any of those career fields. I hope people hear it from me. That's totally awesome. You know what? Cause I mean, I didn't want to be a combat controller. I didn't want to be a Sao T guy. I wanted to be a PJ. Those other jobs didn't interest me in the same way that the other career fields in the Air Force didn't interest me either. Um, so for you to be like, hey, I got the brief. I looked at the job. That's just not what I wanted to do or, or who I am. That's pretty awesome. It's pretty awesome for you to go in open general or open mechanical, really, and then go, okay, wait, let's let's try to see if I can find another job. Now, granted, did, did you get to work on spaceships? Was that a thing? No. Uh, no, I was a C-130 crew chief, which was awesome, but <laughs> it was not a space shuttle. Um, it would have been cool to work on space shuttles. And space shuttles with guns would have been cooler, but the technology, yeah, we never got there. Well, well not, not that you know of. Yeah, well. Right. All right, so C-130 crew chief, that's where you started off? Yeah, so I joined uh, Meet Girls and See the World and got orders for C Herbert Field uh, gunships. And so I'm moving like five hours away from where I joined. And... Yeah. I married a girl I met in tech school, which I know that you guys had a topic about uh, <laughs> recently. Now, the, yep. I am one of the few that that worked with. I'm still married to her, so that and that was 18 years ago. But still, she wasn't in tech school. I was, but she wasn't. Oh, oh well, that doesn't count. That's, that yeah, yeah. You're, you're 23. Right. You're almost a human. So that's true. That's true. Yeah. So yeah, I tip off to Herbert. At that time, it was a lot of fun being, that was AFSOC, I'm at Herbert, I'm AFSOC, but having done nothing to really earn it, right? I'm a maintainer like any other maintainer, working on gunships, but the mission is awesome. Uh, we're deploying to Iraq uh, in short duration deployments, but this is around, uh, this is now like 2006, 2007, 2008. Uh, I went once a year for each of those three years, uh, but they were only three month deployments which is kind of the perfect tempo. Go out, have fun with the fellas, fix the planes, feel very connected to the mission. Gunships was an awesome mission for that because they're coming back Winchester, they're coming back without rounds and you know everybody's jazzed up, everybody's excited. Uh, some of the army guys that were in Balad for R&R &R for other purposes would swing by our compound and see the gunships and they were clearly pretty jazzed about that platform. It seemed like a thing that people like having in the sky uh, over them while they were doing what they had to do. So it was, yes. a, th that mission, uh, was like accidentally more and more rewarding, not knowing how cool, and it's a first term airman. Right? Like I didn't know, I thought that's what everybody's first term airman experience was going to be, was being a Herbert field, working on a gunship and getting to deploy for relatively short periods of time to an AFSOC compound, which is a better compound than any other compound when you're deployed. But you don't know that when you're brand new and you're in LNC or senior in it. So that was a, a like, fantastic time. Stuff, you're like, this could be so much better. And it's like, no, Absolutely. look over the, look over the wall, bro. It, it is yep. better. <laughs> you're what? already at better. We did that. I mean, on our compound, you could wear, it's little things. You could wear PT gear and there was cooler chow halls. And then you would go to the other side of, of Balad and Big Blue would be there. And they're all in PT gear raking gravel and <laughs> You're thinking, this is, I don't know what we did to earn this, but this is clearly a better place to be. And we've done nothing <laughs> to earn it. You just don't know it at that time. But Right. Yeah, I actually and, stayed right over the, uh, I stayed right over the, the wall from you guys. So we stayed, you know, where Prince lined up the, the 60s. During that time, I deployed twice to the same spot. We were right over the wall from there. So it actually, it was cool. It was like your own little area where you were, you know, as secluded as you wanted to be. You could go to your own quiet little chow hall and your own quiet little gym. It was pre pretty great. So not too shabby. Yeah, it was awesome there. And uh, also as a first term airman, I thought that, uh, that I was kind of burnt out on it and I wanted to get away. This is the other terrible thing that happens early in your career is you think you've seen it all wherever you are and you want to go and do something else and you assume that all the good things will be at other you assume your dude station kind of sucks uh, you're like man this place blows I got to get away from here I got to go and do something else uh, so I so I did a BOP uh, with my first reenlistment to go to 
any other duty station because I had to get away from Herbert because, you know, it's just not as much fun as it could be. So at that time, at BOP was eight duty stations. You had to fill out eight duty stations. You couldn't leave anything blank. Now it's a little bit different, or I believe it's a little bit different. You can do hey, LT, one. Can you, it's, it's, go ahead. Can you explain what a BOP is? We got a whole bunch of people that have no idea what that is. Oh, okay. So uh, base of preference was this benefit to your reenlistment. So along with whatever reenlistment bonus you could get, uh, you could put down the basis of preference and you were, I don't want to say guaranteed because it's still the Air Force, but to the highest extent possible, the Air Force would try and move you or will try and move you uh, to a base on that list. And at the time, you could put, you had to put eight bases down that matched with your AFSC. Now I believe the system's a little bit different. Uh, and then this is only for the enlisted, so I'm reaching back a little bit. Now I believe you can just put down one base, and if that gets kicked back, you can do another BOP with one base, therefore mitigating getting something kind of deep on your list down in the seven and eight range, which is exactly what happened to me. <laughs> so I put down I put down eight, eight bases, and at the time, or still currently married to my wife from Missouri, I said, uh, I think there's a base in Missouri, and I think I can work there. I put uh -huh. Whiteman at seven, thinking I'm going to get something in – naive and optimistic at the time, thinking I'm going to get something in the top three. And I believe at the time we were really trying to go to the West Coast. To, we wanted to get out probably here or uh, Salt Lake City, maybe not the coast, but in the west side of the country. And they came back and they said, we'll take you at White. So, was it, yeah, was it better no. than Herbie? <laughs> no, it was not better than Herbie. It was not better than Herbie at all. Um, but... Just look at the consequence of your own actions. Like you dare talk about the redneck Riviera and the panhandle of Florida like that by saying it's not as cool. And then for your, for your complaining, you get Whiteman. Congrats. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's like it classic was, story. Uh, white. Uh, now the B2 from a maintainer's perspective, like the, you kind of get the, uh, you're excited that you're going to go and work at B2, right? That's a, that's a pretty cool aircraft. So showing up and you're working, uh, they're showing you the stealth bomber. You're getting read-ins. You're getting to know how this aircraft's going to work. The, and it is a very cool aircraft. But once that kind of uh, first excitement wears off, you realize it's a very difficult aircraft to maintain. Uh, and the, the great things about a gunship and the great buy-in you have of a real mission, or not, I don't want to say real, uh, of a tactile mission that you can see the effects of and you hear people saying how happy they are for it to be around and you understand the real effects of it and going from that to working deterrence, which is effectively, uh, we have this, don't make us use it. It's a lot more difficult to, and now I'm moving into the phase of being a junior NCO, which I, I know is not real, but an NCO, a staff sergeant. <laughs> and right. have you guys ever been berated for like calling something a junior? Like it's not, somebody used to no. give me shit all the time. I call people NCO. Big. No, I call people baby staffs and texts and then tell, like, when people, like, made master, I'm like, congratulations, you don't know anything. Now you're a baby senior NCO. I don't there care. Like, how, okay. like, imagine having somebody get butthurt over you saying that you're you're not the subject matter expert at your rank. Because there are staff sure. sergeants that are amazing. Like, those dudes that have tested two or three times for tech, they've been a staff sergeant for seven years, and they're yeah. like the technical experts. Like, that's not the same as a guy that just got out of ALS. Like, it's okay to Absolutely. say that. Absolutely. So I'm a junior NCO. I'm at Whiteman. I'm trying to motivate guys to work B2, which is a deterrence mission. It's much more difficult than getting guys up for gunships and uh, and with deployments and, and uh, again, live missions as opposed to deterrence. We did do, uh, at we had Libya while I was at Whiteman, and that was exciting. But the other thing that happens at Whiteman is I was that guy that could not make or could not test for tech. It just... It was kind of, I think that this is, uh, this is like 09 to 15. I'm at Whiteman. It was a lot like it is now. Very difficult to test for promotion. So I'm kind of stuck as like this perpetual staff sergeant, uh, just grinding it out on the flight line, uh, fixing the plane, learning to manage people very well. And maintenance does do a really good job of teaching people to manage people. They, they accidentally, because of the system and hierarchy of getting stuff done on the flight line, you get very proficient at 
you know, a staff sergeant tells airmen what to do. The airmen tell the lower ranking airmen what to do. It works that way on the flight line, as opposed to other jobs in the Air Force, particularly the one I do now. But uh, Whiteman is no, a good can, place for growth. You there. can see that when we have retrainees. Sorry, when we have like retrainees that come over for maintenance, like their expectations of what like their teammates that are airmen, like we'll tell them like, hey, you're the NCIC. They should, you know, you do what you do, keep in charge. Like their their expectations for those airmen are totally different. They're like, hey, if I tell you to jump, like you, like they're meaner than the cadre yeah. are. We're oh, like way bro, worse. Bro, settle down. Right. Yeah, the inmates start running the prison really, really quickly when you get like finally like some poor maintenance dude that's been shit on on the flight line for five straight years and he's an E4 team leader at assessment selection. You're like, wow, this stuff's about to like pull pot levels of dictatorial, <laughs> like authoritarianism. Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. You love that's seeing true. it because right? it's good structure. I don't got to yeah. do anything. Like, yeah, yeah, you run this course. It's fine. Yeah, Sorry. we can be, <clears throat> maintenance can be maniacs. I mean, I've seen that at, I, I've seen that at different PMEs throughout the, or at ALS and COA, uh, and even the cross trainings or the, the other priors, the maintenance guys that have come over to the other side. You can see that they, I don't think we know that when we're in maintenance, that it's so high, you know, that it's more similar to almost other branches. It's, it's closer to almost like the Army. And it's, you know, this job is much more, your, or the job I do now, MQ, uh, MQ-9 pilot is much more experience-based than it is rankings. How long have you done it? How experienced are, are you? And how qualified are you? As opposed to what's your rank. But maintenance is not that way. You could have a guy come in from a different platform, doesn't know anything about D2. If he's a tech sergeant, you're a staff sergeant, you do what that guy says. That's just, you do your best to try and educate him and tell him, hey, if we do it this way, it's probably going to take us five hours instead of four. But at the end of the day, He's the guy in charge. He's the guy with the clipboard and the radio. Do whatever he tells you to do. So, but Whiteman was a bleak and uh, kind of sad place for those six years. However, it was where I did the majority of my college. I start really hammering through uh, a lot of college while I'm there. Uh, and at that time, started, that, again, I was, I was fat when I joined, and I got fat again while I was at Whiteman. Uh, and at this point, the Air Force is starting to draw down and get rid mm -hmm. of people that are fat, as they should and uh, as they were. I got in shape because I started to realize that if I wanted to make this a long-term job, that I needed to prioritize that for the rest of my career. And I got in a good enough shape that I started to think that I could probably be a combat controller if I continued. I didn't. I don't think I understood my own potential or what I was capable of doing back when I'm at basic and they're asking and they're briefing this stuff. I'm thinking there's no way I can ever do any of this stuff. After I start working out for a while, for a couple of years, and now I'm getting, you know, 95s on the PT test. I'm thinking how cool would it be to go and be a combat controller? I put in a package for that and I ship off to Herbert two separate times. And I did not make it past the, they called it pass test when I did it. It's an IFT now. Is that accurate? Correct. Yes. Yeah. That's just your initial test. Uh, but that was an eye-opening experience. I was very happy to have, to try. I was around a lot of that. I, I got to see what I think it takes to make it through uh, some of that stuff. Uh, my favorite, this is a bit of a tangent, but uh, my one of my favorite stories from that era was there was a dude there who was another maintenance guy who had uh, made it like all the way through combat controller, except for a specific dive phase. And I'm not well versed in this. So if I'm saying something that makes no sense, feel free to mute me. The, uh, so he'd made it like all the way to some level of dive and didn't pass. And they said, well, you're going back to being a crew chief. He's in the chief's office and he says, well, put me somewhere at Herbert because I'm coming right back. Here. Like, this is what I'm meant to do. I'm coming right back into this pipeline. So they do, they put him back at gunships. And this is why Tim and I are talking, because I've worked on ships. He's at the same unit that I used to be at. And we're chatting about it. So he's there. He's getting ready to go back into the pipeline again. And the, the pool on base that he can train at, because he's not a combat controller anymore, is just like one of the pools for the families to swim at. And it's closed. He has no access to it. So he's jumping the fence every day and swimming in a closed pool on base to get ready. And I'm thinking, like, this is a – this guy wants – this guy knows that he belongs here, and he's – there's nothing that's going to stop him from getting through this. And now I have no idea if that guy made it. He might have gotten washed out again. But the Kajos seemed to all know him because they were smoking him before we even started the assessment phase. 
Not a good <laughs> sign. Yeah, they know him. Not a good sign, bud. <laughs> Avoid that, dude. <laughs> well, yeah, he made it at least a day further than I did, so that was nice. Well, who hasn't snuck into the Thunderdome for just a little bit of water con? You know, just like, a little bit, just a little bit extra. That old Thunderdome was was rough before they got the STTS pool. Mm-hmm. Is this at Herbert? Yeah, like the the base Wait. pool, whatever. Because they'd put the cover on it in the winter, and it's okay. super echoey. Anyway, Which good on good outdoor, on him. The outdoor one that's over by the track is that that's the STS pool. This is like ten years ago, so. Yeah, if it's uh, uh, that's STTS is right across from the track, right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, sorry. Tangents. Hurl Burton's stories, memories. We. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. So I went while I was at Whiteman. I went down there twice. Got booted back up to Whiteman twice, but kept grinding on the degree. And eventually, I got a phone call that I can go to Wright Pat and work as a subject matter expert for the next generation bomber, which was an awesome opportunity. Maintain a sitting in a room where people want to hear what you have to say, as opposed to, uh, I said, most of the time they just tell you fix the plane and move on with stuff. So that was a fantastic time. And Wright Pat was a pretty cool base uh, there for four years. And at the end of that, now I moved from Wright to Wright Pat as a tech, uh, made master while I was there, and then finished up my math degree, which is a kind of a bizarre story. Getting a, yeah. It was uh yeah, I'll go I'll go back to the math degree. Yeah. It's kind of a single line. The uh so then I finish up my degree, I get commissioned, and now I take off and I'm gonna go and do the MQ nine pipeline. And at that time the way it worked is you would PCS to where you're going to be a pilot at and then kind of TDY or TDY from there and do all the different phases of training. So I moved my family uh, out to Vegas and then I started off, uh, went to Pueblo, Colorado, learned to fly little DA 20s, which was awesome. I mean, at this point I'm 39 years old, didn't think I was ever going to do any flying of any kind. And uh, now I'm flying a plane in Colorado on kind of, you know, I went from, I'm an officer sergeant to, commissioned and flying a plane in you know six to eight months it was pretty wild to go from there to texas and do a lot of t6 simulator work and then i go from there to holloman where we fly mq9s hard paired with sensors and then after that we come to come to vegas and i do my actual like mission qualification training and now and the coolest part of all that is after 15 years and being a master sergeant, this particular officer job, I mean, I spend the majority of my day sitting next to a junior enlisted. So I'm enlisted, I think maybe more now than any other officer job in the Air Force, I'm constantly next to senior airmen, NCs. So it's pretty cool. But Wait, wait. So go, so go back. <clears throat> Sure. Besides the, the soul-crushing loneliness that was Whiteman, uh, sure. why did you even start going to school? You know what I mean? Like, like from the very beginning, like, the, you, you have, like, this thing where you start going to school. Did you have a plan or not? And then you end up with a math degree, which is super weird. Like, no one gets a math right. degree while they're in. Okay, maybe right. just one, one guy. And then, like, and then it turns into this thing. Like, how, does, how, does, how do you start with one decision and end up where you're at, leaving the senior NCO Corps to go be a second lieutenant, which is also wild. All right. So the college thing started very, very simply. It probably ended even ended simply too. So I'm at Herbert and I've got a good supervisor that's like, we want to get you BTZ. Anybody that know, that's below the zone senior airman. So you get a stripe six months before you would normally get the stripe. I, I was a good performer on the flight line. I did my job very well. Uh, I didn't do a lot of the volunteering stuff, which in maintenance and a lot of other jobs, they want you to do a bunch of other silly stuff to look good on your record so you can get these packages. But college did, college has legs on those packages. So if you've done any college and they put that on that package, it's really helping. So he said, hey, you're doing good on the flight line. You do your job well. 
go over to the education center and collect a class so I can put this on here and we can get this BTZ package through. And I did exactly that. I went and collected a class. And then once I was going to the education center, I would say, what do I do next? And they would say, collect this class and then collect this class. And then I went to ALS and they said, uh, you know, we used to give you speech credits for this course. We no longer give you speech credits, but we promise if you walk right from this, right from graduation back over to that education center and you take the Dantes, which is just another kind of club for speech, you'll pass it. I didn't like speech. So I said, that's a great idea. I went over there, I clipped it, and I got my CCAF. All right, so well, hold on. This is There's an educational benefit in the Air Force, everybody that's out there. So we always talk about the Air Force having the best educational benefits and the best quality of life stuff. The Air Force has two different programs, CLEP and Dante's, where they will let you walk into a testing center, sight unseen, and for free, take a test. If you score high enough on the test, you get college credits out of it. I did almost the exact same thing. I, didn't, I do not care about... Uh, four-year degree. I'm a bad example on this. So this is not me being a role model, everybody. Uh, surprise. I do not care about a four-year degree. When it came time for me to be an instructor, they were like, hey, you have to have your CCF. I'm like, well, I've got like enough credits. I just need it, whatever. I ended up clepping my way to a CCF the same way. Like it took me two times to pass the math thing because unlike you, I'm pretty stupid when it comes to numbers. <laughs> and I actually just took a test and they were like, yep, congratulations. This made one of my friends so mad. They had a four-year degree from like a brick and mortar. Like they went to school like when they were supposed to in 18 to 21. And they were like, hold on. So they just let you go take a test. And you basically got out of it like two semesters worth of prereqs. Like you took, I mean, I clipped humanities, math, yep. speech. So I, I had like five, five tests, tests five, that I took. Yeah. Five I courses. took the five tests. And I went out. five. For, yeah. yeah. I went five for five and I got it. And by the way, that's free. Like you don't, you don't have to pay for that at all. You just went and right. you took it. So that's a great way to, to utilize the educational benefits. You don't even have to go to class. If you learn enough from your job, you could just go in and test out of it. Poof, three college credits. So good on you. I just wanted to explain Clep and Dante's continue. Absolutely. So now I've got a CCAF. I've got that on my EPR. Uh, my performance report makes me look good. But now that I've been going to the education center, I regularly to take these claps, I kind of say, what's next? What do I do? I can't use any more, you know, we're using bullets for our EPR. Once you have the CCAF, that bullet's kind of done. And now you've got this empty space on your EPR. So you say, what do I, how do I continue on this degree? At that point, we had a program called uh, AECP, I believe. And if you finished these core classes, uh, you've got your calculus, your chemistry, your physics, a handful, you had a specific amount of credits that you got, then the Air Force would send you to a four-year school and you could you'd get paid staff sergeant while you went and finished the last two years of your school, which sounded amazing to me at the time. I said, so they're <laughs> going to pay me. This isn't like a GI Bill. They're going to pay me my salary while I go and I get an engineering degree. I couldn't imagine anything better. So I start chipping away at the chemistry and the physics and these kind of lower or depending on who you are, higher level math, the trade and, and the calculus and all this stuff. So I'm accomplishing this. This kind of transitions from Herbert to Whiteman. And all along, again, I'm getting, so tuition assistance is paying for all the school. So it's not, nothing's coming out of pocket. Um, and this is filling out my EPR. And I mean, I guess a little inside baseball to, you know, military enlisted is that if you're not doing this college stuff, then they're kind of pressuring you more to do the volunteer stuff, which I think we all collectively eye rolled early. Like I didn't want to do any of that. College was at least something that was going to be a long-term benefit to me. Whereas, you know, setting up the bounce houses, you know, and knob noster was not, yeah. <laughs> somebody has got to do that, but I didn't want, it, I didn't want to do it. And I was, I was so glad we moved away from that. So the new, uh, EPB system. Uh, and it's been, it's been moving that way for a long time. Like the whole volunteerism thing. And I remember growing up too. So I got in just a couple of years before you. So I, I mean, exact same path, just a little bit, a little bit ahead of you on this one, but it would frustrate me so bad. I think that I had this great reporting period. I slide this bad boy across the desk, be like, look what I did at work. And they're like, well, did you read any books to local elementary schools? Yeah. Did you pick up yep. trash as part of your ALS class? And I'm like, what, why does that matter to me being in the military? And they're like, well, you got to, it's volunteerism. I'm, I'm glad that we got away from it, but it, 
it went way too far at one point. You know, people with EPBs or at the time EPRs, they'd slide across the decks and it was like three fourths, like, oh, I'm a baseball coach on the weekends and I'm a big brother, big sister. But like, yeah, but you didn't, you took time off of work to go do mm-hmm. all those things. Yeah. So oh, yeah. why does that, why does that matter? Anyway, just a you weird thing you, that we dealt with. Yeah. You know why you don't like volunteering? It's because you were good at your job. Right. Because <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't have time. I didn't have time to volunteer because I was working 12 on 12 off for my entire life. It was a oh, weird I, path to promotion for people that sucked at their, their job. Mm-hmm. But hopefully we've got there, there was a ton of resentment for those guys. I mean, when on the flight line, guys that, you know, it's cold and dirty out there. You're doing your job and, you know, somebody has to be on day. Also, maybe it's a shift work. We're working days, swings, and nights. And guys that didn't want to work the shift work and they would stay on day shift and, and do these types of things. Uh, I don't think it was. I don't think it was fun for them, but maybe maybe they didn't care. So, but yeah. So that so, leaves me. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm in college, right? Yeah. yeah you're yes. Not, knocking out your degree because of your EPR, but also just because you're like, yeah, let's just keep going. This is for me, and I don't want to volunteer. So sure. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, it, I I I'm really knocking out the degree at that point. I'm selfishly doing it so that I can. This two years off from the Air Force where I can That's do, right. where I can go. And in my mind, I'm going to Mizzou for two years getting paid staff sergeant pay. And just being, because I, I squandered my college years earlier. I'm thinking I, I can get this back if I, I'm like, what? I just got to take chemistry and calculus? Like that's the, that's the barrier for entry into <laughs> being a, and which is not true. Like even if I had gotten there at right. this point, I'm 30 with a couple of kids. I'm not going to be, you know. <laughs> It's not going to be animal house when I get there, right? Right. You're not going to kegs and eggs for the football exactly. game, for the Mizzou football game. Like, you have children. You're making pancakes, my guy. Exactly. So I'm do- I compile this whole package. I go to the education center. And I say, I'm going to apply for ACP. And they say, cool story. We're done with that program. <laughs> Which is kind of a gut punch at that point because I've leaned into this STEM degree that, you know, I guess I'm a quarter or a third of the way into a STEM degree. And now there's kind of nothing to do. Uh, I go back to work. Um, at the time, I've got a, a commander support staff stint. And uh, a new guy is being in processed into the unit. And the commander says, uh, he's advising him on where to take college and what to do. And he says, well, uh, you know, Pops is doing a bunch of college. Ask him what he's doing. And I said, you know, they canceled AECP. So I guess I could go to UCM and get a math degree. And I'm being really flippant about it. Like, but that would be a waste of my time. And the commander calls me out on the spot at that point. Uh, and he says, yeah, but you're too good for that. Kind of saying, like, he, he's making fun of me thinking that I am, that that's beneath me to go and, and get this math degree. And I kind of got pissed about it. I said, yeah, well, I'll just do that. Then. So I start going. I'm working swing shift as a crew chief, and then so every you got day a, you got a math degree, ironically, to make somebody mad. Okay, out of spite. Okay, hey, I'm here for it. Dad, I can get a math degree. <laughs> Which, by the way, I am not like I'm good at college algebra. I'm good at high school algebra. The guys that get math degrees are uh, significantly smarter. And had I, I should not have pursued that. That probably was. Not, I mean, I ended up. I did get the degree. That was a mistake. But it was, I should not have done that. I should not have done that. Yeah, mistakes were made. Uh, so I'm going. I'm going to. This is in Warrensburg, Missouri, which is about 20 minutes away from. Whiteman. Every morning I go in there. I go to college with like all these big brains. There's there's a couple flavors of math degrees, none of which are active duty crew chief. Uh, there's there's like. Uh, actuaries, which is actually a pretty cool job. Uh, they, they're like odds makers for insurance companies. There's math teachers who kind of get to college out al- or, you know, an algebra level and they go and teach high school math. And then there's pure math. And the only other people I met that were pure math degrees were dual computer science degrees, which meant that they, I mean, they couldn't hold eye contact or, you know, tell a story, but they had all of you know, math secrets in their brain. I was none of these things. And I certainly wasn't those guys. And they would see me in uniform. I go, well, I got to go and like fix a plane at 3 PM. And, but I'm in, 
I took differential equations three times. I kept washing, like I kept failing these classes and I did have to pay the TA back. If you fail a class, you have to pay the TA back. They, they tell yeah. you that, but I'm, I probably paid more TA back than most. Uh, <laughs> kept showing back up. And I think the teachers, I think honestly, the department was like, that guy will keep coming back. He will not stop. I turned into the guy at Herbert that was jumping the fence for the pool. And I would, uh, I actually, I emailed my advisor on some of these times I would get washed out of a class and I would say, is there any other degree I can get at this school? And they said, because you've done so much stuff for STEM or so many other, you know, like math classes and chemistry and physics, all this stuff, that's all just going to be electives. Your electives are going to be maxed out. It's going to be like starting over. I said, all right, well, I guess I'll take differential equations again. I'll just show up for the third time and I'm sure that I'll, I'll get third through time's it. Third charm. Why not? So at this point, the, I'm still kind of, I'm getting my degree out of spite and a little bit of, I'm a, go ahead. Question. What, what did your wife say when you had to pay your TA back? Because I'm assuming that was a fun conversation to have. And then you went back again. Right. And then again. Just curious. I mean, she, she was not, she wasn't pleased, but at the same time, I think she knew she's been an awesome, she's, she's like the best military wife ever. She, She'll complain with me about stuff when it's time to complain, but she also knows that it's the gig when it's the gig. And I think that she kind of thought of college at that stage as the gig. Now, again, like the commissioning stuff is kind of sunset at this point because the commissioning was a part of going to the zoo and, and, and doing that. I'm thinking that that's out the window, but you still really have to have a bachelor's to make chief or, or to, you know, it's kind of a glass ceiling for senior and almost, I think it might even be a reg at the, I, Shouldn't throw that you out there. Have, uh, your your two year, I think, is as a if not a real requirement, it is a requirement for senior. And then there's not that many chiefs that are making it, at least not early on, without a without a bachelor's degree. Yeah, especially especially at that time around then, it's it's a little bit different now, where you know some chiefs have snuck through without a bachelor's degree. But yeah, hundred percent, you're you're dead on there. You you weren't making it, especially at that time, without a sure. four year degree. And even now, it's it's a pretty standard thing that they expect you to have it. So this is my mindset's kind of changing of I've got to get the degree to make myself more successful as an NCO. Uh, and this is the only degree that I can really pursue. So I kind of just keep driving ahead at it. Uh, I've now left Missouri. I'm in Ohio. This is even pre COVID. I said, I've only got, I think three classes left with the university of central Missouri. And even before COVID they said, well, you can just, uh, a video conference in for all these for these remaining classes, which was very kind of them. And they let officers in my unit ex- administer the tests for my last couple of classes, which was also very That's helpful. cool. Yeah, yeah, it was. They were very, very they knew you were helpful. helpful. Yeah, they, they they knew who you were. Yeah, and they knew, they they knew I needed all the help I could get, so maybe that was a benefit too. So eventually, grad, I get this degree. Uh, I get like a 2.8 math degree. <laughs> now, the other thing that's kind of critical along this education journey is now I'm working in at Wright Pat as a subject matter expert, but I'm working around a ton of engineers uh, and program managers if uh, in the acquisition world. So now I actually realize the value of a math degree. I'm working around these guys and they're like, yeah, hey, you can apply for some of these jobs. But we treat math degrees like engineering degrees. And I'm I'm a little excited about it. I go, well, I didn't, you know, I was just doing this so that I could make senior and make chief. I didn't realize that this would actually be valuable in the outside world. And I was too stupid <laughs> to understand how hard the math degree was. I didn't know, like, as I'm grinding through this whole thing, that it's an impossible degree and nobody should ever attempt to do this. <laughs> like people, people know you by and they're like, oh my God, that's the guy that's doing straight up math. Like the, the people that you think are that much smarter than you see you come in and they're like, there's no way I could do what that guy's doing. This is his third time in this stupid class. Yeah, absolutely. And the, there's a lot of people that just quit STEM because they're kids that, again, I'm too dumb to know to quit this, but they're kids that got like 4.0s all the way through high school. They walk into Diffy Q, they get a C, and they're like, no thanks. I don't, like, I'm not, this isn't for me. My ego not me. You're like, C's not get degrees, me. baby. 70% yeah, standard. That's a pass, brother. That's a pass. Yeah. So Hilarious. I, do, I, I grind out this degree. Now I'm at right. Uh, I'm like, all right, cool. I checked that box. I'm done with school. This is now, 
I mean, this has got to be like a decade long pursuit to get this degree because it's, it's taken so long. i I'm 15 years in, I'm a master sergeant. Uh, I'm looking at probably leaving right pat and going back into like flight line maintenance and the people I'm working for, they're, uh, very, very good people. They, they're like, Hey, we can still make this commissioning thing happen. And at that point I kind of did the mental math of, uh, so I'm 15 years in, if I, if I make chief, which there's never a guarantee for chief, I felt really confident about making senior. I thought I feel pretty good. Like I'm going to make senior. Who knows if you're going to make chief, but if I did 23 years in, didn't sound like a crazy number for me commissioning, you have to do a 10 year commitment. So, uh, and if anybody like, if you commission before 10 years, it's kind of a wash or before 10 years of, uh, of enlisted time, it's kind of a wash because you're probably going to retirement and that 20 adds up and everything's fine. If you commission after 10 years of enlisted time, like me, 15 years, you're tacking on another 10 years to be able to retire as an officer, which was going to be 25 years before retirement. But again, I'm thinking, all right, 23 years. Uh, I'll make that deal if you gave me that deal today. And you're saying 25 years as a captain. And whether it's right or wrong, a captain makes more than a chief. I said, all right, I'll make that deal. Uh, and I got to say, you know, these are the jobs that I was willing to go in for. And I said, I'll take kind of open again. I said, uh, I would do acquisitions officer because I'd been working with those guys. I thought that sounded cool. Uh, I put down maintenance, although I was terrified that I might get maintenance as a maintenance <laughs> officer. And I, and at that point, they had raised the age on MQ-9 pilots, and they, they were hiring a bunch of MQ-9 pilots. And I thought, I had been in a support pilot for a long time in the Air Force. Who doesn't want to be the actual mission? I'd love to be a part of the mission and do the mission. And I put that down. Didn't have to have any waivers for any of that stuff. I passed a flight physical previously because of trying to be a combat controller. So I put all that stuff in, I got picked up for select PO, which is kind of the new version of AACP, which is what I was going after 10 years ago. And I said, yeah, you're our guy. And uh, got to go into OTS and which was, and that's been a wild experience being, you know, being older, being a, a, a senior NCO that's now around a bunch of, you know, now all my peers are, 25. Uh, it's been awesome. And uh, yeah, the Air Force has given me almost all the cool things I've ever gotten. So it's pretty cool. What was it, li- what was it like showing up that first day at OTS? I mean, you, you, were, you were a decade and a half in. You were showing up as a, as a grown man with children and a wife and a life. And you like this math degree and all this other stuff. How crazy, I mean, immediately they're like, obviously the call sign pops, like obviously people are going to make fun of you for being old and, and talk about it. Cause that's the low hanging fruit. But as you looked around, what were the challenges you faced for being older? And then what, what additional benefit was it? People ask us all the time. It's one of our questions we get, I don't know, every other day, Hey, I'm older. I'm older. Is there going to be a problem? I'm older. Is there going to be a problem? And we talk to them about it all the time. From your perspective, what challenges did you have? Cause you were older. And then what benefit did you have because you were older? Um, the bit, so first off, we got there in the height of COVID. So my OTS class was, I think, the first OTS class they started back up after shutting the whole thing down for COVID. And we had to be uh, quarantined in our rooms at OTS, which is not quite, well, it's nothing like basic. It's more like a tech school where you've got like two people to a room all the way down the, all the, way down the hall. And uh, we're all in civilian clothes. I was prepared for it to be basic because that was you know, the most similar thing to me it is somewhere in between basic and tech school and the people in my class. So we're all quarantined and I'm handing out MREs because we're going to live in our rooms for a week while we quarantine. They all thought I was like a nice gentleman that like a civilian that worked in the building <laughs> that was just there to <laughs> take care of them. You're the janitor. You're the they house thought, mouse. Oh man, yeah, this they, is awesome. They give us they our own enlisted it. sweaty guy to give us food. This is great. Well, I was in civilian clothes, so they just thought that I was some nice older gentleman there to, to feed them and take <laughs> their trash out. And then I was immediately tapped as the first uh, flight leader. Of course. The, uh, NTI at the time. The, the benefit of, being, of the experience was knowing, I think that at OTS, especially for the people with no prior experience, 
the shocking thing for me at OTS was how many people were priors. I mean, it was my, my flight was a, probably 50% prior of some level, whether that was guard and they'd gotten out for a while and they'd come back or they'd been in some other branch and they'd come back or they were active, uh, active enlisted going over uh, to the officer side. So whereas I thought I was going to be really, really unique, uh, it wasn't wild as I thought it was going to be. There were a lot more peers than, than I thought. It was about half of us had some level of pride there was a handful of other mechanics. There was a, uh, there were even people that were kind of close to my age. Oh, uh, I think half of them also had kids. It was a much older group because there's a lot of direct commissions, which are, they were going into medical and, you know, they're not really, they're not really in the military. Like they're, you know, they're wearing a rank and they're working at the hospital, but they're not doing a lot of the stuff that we're doing. So they kind of got, they had the, you know, the basic scaries. They, they're getting yelled at for the first time. And they're, you know, maybe in their 30s and they're getting yelled at for the the first time. I am a doctor. You don't raise your voice to a CRNA like that. Do you know what those letters mean? Shut up. Yeah. Where's where's HR at? Where do I find HR here? (laughs) Where do I find HR? My my first roommate when I got to OTS was was a doctor. He was a first generation immigrant from Nepal. We're in the room the first night and he turns to me and he says, you've been in the military for a while. I said, yeah, I've been in for a bit. And he goes, uh, so you're like familiar with this type of, of training with us, you know, with the, t- he's referring to the TIs. And I said, yeah. And he looks at me and he goes, are they going to hit us? And I said, no, nah, man, they're not going to hit us. You have just- one chance. Yes. Oh yeah. No, they're going to, they're just waiting. They're just waiting. Their favorite time to hitch is when you're in the bathroom. So you got to be careful. They're sneaky. So they can break goes, one. I've got buddies that are in the army in Nepal. And I was like, oh, yeah, what's that like? And he goes, they hit them. And I was like, yeah. oh, this, be, this is nothing like that. That dude couldn't he, be shook at all. That guy, because he was, a, he was like an as ER doctor. He fig- as soon he, as he figured out physical violence was off the table, he was just cool. He was like, oh, no, they're not going to hit us? All right, I got this. That's absolutely correct. That was his demeanor for the next, like, six weeks, was they can't hit us and – TIs would get in his face. He, it would be his turn to like march the flight to chow or something like that. And he would screw it all up. It, we'd be like marching into a building. TIs <laughs> would come running over and all get in his face. And he could not get, they, they could not get his, his pulse up. I mean, and I'd asked him about it later. I said, why is it that you're so calm in all this? Cause you've never been around any of it. And he said he was a, he did his internship as an ER doc. And he said, when you're a doc in that situation, they teach you like you can't run and you can't look flustered because all the nurses will lose their mind. So you have to like walk calmly from patient to patient, make life or death uh, decisions. And if you can't do it and look calm, then you're useless. And I, so like a TI at OTS was not going to get this guy riled up after he'd made those decisions. But yeah, he was a cool dude. Uh, that, I mean, knowing that the military, knowing that OTS was essentially a no fail course, was the calming and the the part of my experience that made it the easiest. So, and I mean, maybe it shouldn't be a no fail course, but if you, you know, if you do your assignments and you're, you know, Air Force fit, you're making it through that without like the selection for that or your a package being approved is really where all the attrition happens for OTS. Uh, it's like a, like a PME course, more or less. You know, as long as yes. you do... The, what you absolutely have to do they're the, you know they've already made the investment they've you've already been you know put against a position for the next fiscal year to be a second lieutenant you know like if you start just washing people out the the a1 nerds up at the pentagon are going to lose their minds yeah um they do a good job of telling you that that's not the case they're going to try and trick you as they do a basic too they're like look we're gonna you know if i catch another thread on your uniform i'm recycling you but at the end of the day, it just wasn't happening. There, were, you know, everybody was going to make it through pretty unscathed. Um, I don't think there were any hard parts of being the older guy in there. Again, like I said, the, the, the community was very, very different than what I thought it was going to be. I thought I was going to be this huge outlier. That happened when I went on to to pilot training. That's when I became like, that's when I became tops. Like, this is the oldest dude anybody's ever seen in the Air Force, which was funny to me because I'm like that. Where I came from, I had peers that were my age and older, but in this world, I'm I'm the old man. 
Yeah, but we, we talk about it all the time too. And being, there's something about being around the young folks, you know, like on team or whatever. And once you lose that, it's weird. But is there like this energizing factor? Like you're around all these like motivated young folks out of college, you know, and your, your kids are probably thinking about college at this point. Um, but like, you know, there's a, there's a certain thing that happens where it's like, yeah, you're 30 something years old. You're in your late thirties. Um, but it's, it's nice to be around that, that energy, you know, and you get something out of it. Without a doubt. Yeah. These, I mean, these guys keep me young all the time. Like it, I'm hanging out with, again, in my job, all the, you know, the pilots are mainly in their mid twenties, but also the sensors who's operating the camera on the Q9. These are young enlisted. This is A1C and senior airmen. So yeah, I'm around them all the time. These are, you know, this is my team, which is kind of what we call a shift is our team. Uh, this is who I spend all my time with. These guys know my kids and they, you know, we have a softball league and we all play together. Uh, I'm around them all the time. I pick them up on youthful lingo and you know, it, it does, it does make you young. And I mean, there's a Delta of, it is a very bizarre thing when I've got a guy that sits in the right seat that's 19 and a daughter at home that's 15 and how close that is. They're much closer to each other than I am to him. But I think of them as very different things. He's a coworker and she's my kid. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it happens all the time. I get to see the world through their eyes. And you know, perspective is probably one of the most important things for, for all of life. And they get some of my perspective and I get a lot of their perspective uh, on everything that we're dealing with all the time. There's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of military stuff. You know, Shut up in color. Although it's annoying, like it has its place. And occasionally you just have to do the job. You don't agree with how we came with it or how the decision was, was made. But we've got to go and do the job. And it's frustrating sometimes to see people not understand that. But it's also cool to see them kind of grow with it. And it's fun to be the guy sitting there next to him saying like, hey, there's always a time to complain. There's always, I'll never tell a military member that they shouldn't bitch. I think that it is an art when done craftfully and well. And when we're sitting, you know, eight hours next to each other in the GCS and we're just complaining about, you know, anybody and everything, that's great. But you complain in the right, I mean, I think what it's in like Saving Private Ryan, like gripes go down, right? They don't go up. We complain at our level and below. And I think I'm a good example for that. Like I don't complain. I don't use my prior experience to go in and tell the major how it's gonna be or what I'm gonna do. I do whatever. The same duties as any other lieutenant. What is nice is uh, like going to the OPB, UPB world. Because I've pretty much made my retirement rank, I don't have to worry a whole lot about those aspects. So I do my duties, my primary duties, and I don't really have to worry about the blow up houses in Knob Noster anymore. So. I do like that. What are some other lessons that you, you kind of like, cause the, the generational gap is super interesting to me. Like just sitting, you know, across from that 19 year old who's, you know, got broccoli hair and he's talking about, he's a Rizzler and he's going to go to an online event. And you're like, what are you even, what are you even talking about? You know, it, and it's funny because we have the same conversations, right? Like we, we laugh at the differences of communication when somebody sends us a DM and it's, oh a thousand words with no punctuation. And it's just like, as that person talks, like just cold sends us a message without the trappings of like, hi, this is my name. This is how I found you. This is what I'd like you to answer. What are some of those other, uh, what are some of those other lessons that you try to, to tell these young folks other than shut up and color, which we've talked about a ton of times. And we see, by the way, the exact same thing when we talk, you know, to people is that's the distinct difference between, you know, Trent, myself, Jared, is that sometimes like if you raise your voice loud enough around me and it's not dumb, illegal or different, I'll probably just do that. You're like, we need this moved. I'll look around and be like, oh, yeah, it makes sense. All right. You're yelling. I'll get it done. Um, you know, what, what are some of those other nuances that you've been trying to like bring in to those, to those that, younger. I don't, that you're I don't sitting think with? this is necessarily a generational thing. What's that? No, that was just a lag real quick. We lost him for a second. But it was just a ahead, delay. Please. You talked through the I think delay. That not necessarily generational. Uh, but being new in the Air Force is knowing is knowing how important I think a lot of people get lost on how important it is to be good at your job. And uh, even with the volunteer gigs and the you know the small jobs here and there, being able to uh, being good at your job is incredibly important, whether you're a mechanic or an MQ9 pilot or an MQ9 sensor, 
being proficient and being, uh, being reliable, like being the rock. Like if I call you and need you to come in and do your job today, I know that you're somebody that can come in and do it. And I think that the short term people don't see how valuable that is. But then after five years in, 10 years in, 15 years in, they start to see how much you can be rewarded and how much value there is to being a guy like, Oh no, he's got it. He's not going to go. He's not going to go to NIF when we need, when we're at minimal manning, he's going to be able to, to get this mission done. He's going to be able to be spun up on something very quickly. Uh, being reliable is incredibly valuable. And I think that uh, being new in the air force, it's, it's easy to be distracted away from that and think that your career is a, you know, culmination of how many special gigs did you do? How did you get across the, you know, are you on the commander's radar? And occasionally it's like, no, you don't want to be on the radar. You like, don't be on the radar for, you just take care of your stuff. You, you don't miss your IMR readiness stuff. You don't, you're not showing up red for a bunch of different currencies all the time. Uh, that I think is the lesson that being new in the military, people lose sight of uh, early. Well, Generationally, a- I think that we're all, everybody, you know, it's always easy to say that the new generations play we are not paying attention. That's silliness. But you, you have a unique perspective too, because your, your career is bookended by these, these jobs that are very close to the pointy end of the stick, right? Of, of, you know, us foreign policy. And so then you've been in the middle there too, where you, you weren't very close to it, you know, and, and, and being reliable and all this other stuff, it's not as tactile as you put it, Yeah. how much that affects what actually happens, you know, whether the missiles or the bombs go or, or whether or not we, we get into another war with X, Y, and Z. Um, so I think that that perspective is probably super helpful for the the young folks coming up and, even though they are close to the pointing end of the stick, like you, you can see it when they're, they're going through their phases, you know, like you said, like you, you lost your motivation mid career and you kind of got chubby again and you had to get it back. And so like, I think just having you around, like it's, it's nice to be able to look at those younger people and be like, Hey, I know where you're at. Like, I'm not you, but this is, this is how you get past that. And this is why this matters and explaining all these things to them. Uh, Cause I'm one of those people. I, I, I have a hard time without a why, you know, why are we doing stuff? And, um, but I, I think you're in a, a unique position to to help shape them to be the the people that we want them uh, to be, you know, after we're all gone. Yeah, and I can't say enough about like the sensors that I work with. I think that they are a, uh, they're very smart. They're very capable. They've made it through some level of attrition to be able to do their job. Uh, they see uh, sometimes to their detriment. They see their value. They know uh, what they're capable of. They're treated a lot like a co-pilot a lot of the time, but for you know, maybe half the price. Uh, so, and uh, yeah. you want to talk, there, there is definitely a wage gap. And by you having a senior airman sitting next to you, you guys are really saving on that OCO money. So that's, oh, that's yeah. good. You know, you're getting them at a, yeah. at a high benefit. So that's but tight. On the other hand, they get to sit in a nice climate controlled booth and hang out with, you know, a cool prior all the time. Like they, yeah. they, <laughs> they, they're not on the flight line. They're not, uh, yeah. they are working shift work. Uh, which nobody seems to like, but I seem to have adapted to somehow over, you know, the past 18 years, but there's benefits. They'd make a little bit more, uh, as you guys, I mean, there, there's some sweeteners in there for them. Uh, probably not enough, but you know, we could all make a little bit more, right? I mean, that's always good. Exactly. Wait, so, I do, sorry. Do you laugh when like you hear them saying stuff like, I want to get out of this base and I want to go somewhere else where it's better. You know, I want to get out absolutely. of Vegas. Absolutely. That's, I mean, with, without a doubt. Like, but I also know that that's their journey, right? Like I wouldn't have listened to me if I was, you know, if somebody said that, I remember, I remember the guys that heard the same. I remember the guys that had come from the duty station and they're like, dude, I don't know why you're trying to go anywhere. It's never going to get any better than this. And I was like, yeah, what do you know? You're, I mean, it's a very na- normal thing. Like these, these old cats don't understand anything. I got to go somewhere. Yeah. There's nothing to do in Vegas. That's my favorite thing to hear ever. Right? There's hilarious. nothing to do here. This place is, yeah. Yeah, I love, yeah, man, I am such a, man, I am so biased towards Vegas. It's why I retired here. I love this town. Like, I mean, we went to the zoo, saw butterflies and had like a five-star meal yesterday. That's just Monday. That's just Monday in yeah. Vegas. We didn't even, you know what I mean? It's crazy. Yeah. Um, man, I'll tell you what though, that's a valuable perspective. And I kind of want to talk just, just specifically about, you know, MQ9s and the job itself. 
for anybody that's out there that wants to touch the mission, right? And that's a weird thing to say, but you want to you wanna have that job satisfaction. And as a maintainer, I know it's tough. You know, as a guy that I was a supervisor of, you know, at one point, like 17 or 19 AFSCs, and not all of those, it's hard to explain to a personnelist, hey, you keeping this person on status means that they can go down range and kill people, or they can go down range and they can save people. People might want to touch that mission and be a part of that actual tactile mission accomplishment. What would you say to those people that want to do that, but they don't want to be operators? Do you think MQ-9 is that place? Like, what are the benefits of the MQ-9 um, career field other than, you know, what you already mentioned? You know, highly team focused. You guys sound like you have a great thing going where you're all moving towards the same mission. What are some other benefits to being an MQ-9 driver? Well, you, I mean, you get to see the mission unfold in front of you. I mean, it's very... I think that MQ-9, as opposed to maybe other flying platforms, I, like there's the main difference that we're not in the sky doing it. Uh, we're on the ground while we do it, but it's very Intel focused. So you're getting, you're watching the Intel develop real time. So if you have any kind of, you know, if you think Intel is interesting at all, then you're going to love an MQ-9 mission because you're developing all that raw, all that raw stuff. Uh, the amount of time you get to do it when you compare MQ-9 hours to like any other platform's hours, we're doing it so much. It's very, one of the interesting similarities between maintenance and MQ-9 is on any other platform, your job's kind of to train and then hope, or maybe not hope, but eventually go and do that mission downrange, right? So it's train, 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 go do the mission downrange. MQ-9 and maintenance is we do the same job every day. We like sprinkle in the training while we're doing the same thing all day, every day. So I'm constantly doing the mission of MQ-9 while we you know, balance the competing training requirements and getting everybody else spun up to be able to do that mission. So kind of exactly, I mean, exactly like you said, we are attached to the mission arguably as much as you could be in the Air Force daily. Uh, even being stateside because we're flying missions all the time, as opposed to just talking about what the mission will eventually be like when we get to it. Does that answer your right. question or was that a little too roundabout? No, it's perfect because it has so many parallels to what it is that we do as well, right? Like I wanted to ask to hear from your side of it, how exactly that happens. We do the same thing, right? You're going to go out and you're going to jump free fall today. Well, that's, that's actually the mission. You're actually getting yeah. good at doing what it is that we need to. We're just doing it stateside. We look around, we're like, Hey, here's what we're going to work on for this specific training event. Well, you're actually doing it. Like you're actually training to go to the mission and we use different stuff like moulage and, and pyrotechnics and all that other stuff. But that's exactly what I was getting at is, you know, yeah, it's training, but it's training while you have an actual bird in the air that you're controlling and you got somebody over your shoulder helping them like, Hey, this is why I'm doing this. This is how we develop the picture that you're looking at now. This is how we fly this pattern to be most supportive to the people that need us. That's an amazing thing that not a lot of people grasp when they talk about the MQ9 career field is that you're, you're dead, right? That training happens with birds in the air, with live munitions on them, with a live sensor, with a live team that you have to work and coordinate with. And that you can't get that anywhere else. And if you think about that senior airman, man, you want to be a 19 year old that's in charge of national level missions. I know a place that you could do that under the watchful eye of a Mustang named Pops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is a, uh, it, it is, it's sometimes a little easy to get complacent with it. Like when you do it every day, it's it's easy to forget. Like we're doing the thing right now, and we're doing it all day with X amount of sorties. Uh, but it is very cool. It's very rewarding to be in the mission anytime you're at work. Absolutely. Pops, we can't say thank you enough. What we do uh, here is usually we end on advice, right? So for anybody that wants to get into the Air Force, anybody that's thinking maybe, maybe they are batting around right now going in open mechanical, or maybe they are batting around going in open general, or they don't know what they want to do. Um, you know, you obviously connect with MQ-9s, but you've got a rich history with maintenance behind you and some of the other cooler positions that you've got. So for, for those, those cats, you know, officer enlisted, that are sitting out there right now trying to weigh their options as, as the summer comes up and we've graduated high school and maybe there's a cross training out there thinking about doing something else. What advice would you give to them to get to a position where they have the fulfillment that you do? Uh, stay positive and uh, try and count uh, how many good things there are around you before you are counting all the bad things. There's probably, uh, especially if you're looking at getting into the Air Force or 
there, there are a lot of really, really good things. It's easy to get bogged down with the negatives. Uh, being in the dorms or, you know, just being in the pools, have fun complaining, but at the end of the day, realize how many good things you're getting out of the Air Force. And, uh, you know, we talked a lot about education, a lot of different places that I've been. Uh, you know, I wouldn't have my three kids or my wife uh, or, or any of the other things, or many of all of the friends that I've made in the last 18 years if it weren't for the Air Force. Uh, it's given me pretty much all the great things I've had while doing it. So just stay positive and count the great things around you. And keep in mind, the panhandle of Florida is better than Missouri. I just want to sure. make sure that we Which, yeah, get that out Now we're trying there. to get back there. Now we're trying to go back to Missouri. So <laughs> this is a great choice. Is, uh, that's where I'm trying to go back and retire. But, I love uh, the plot to us at the end. Thank yeah, goodness yeah, it grew on you. You know, like, you're 21 in the panhandle. You're like, I can do better than this. Or 23. It's just like, no. Yeah. No, no, you can't. No. Are you going to Patrick? If you're not going to Patrick, then no. That, then no, yeah. You're going to further south. There's a lot of time down there, too, TY. That, that's an awesome place. That was on the short list of where you went to, too. Which, Heck yeah, that's Space Coast, baby. That... Oh, oh no. I'm here for it. Before, but I'm curious. It, we talked about cross training and doing one thing at the other. In your guys' experience, what's the. What's the best group that's cross? Like, what AFSC is the best one to see coming as a cross trainer? Oh, nice. Trent, I'll, I'll let you go first. I'm a little biased just because I, I know a bunch of these people, but like it, it, it depends on the person. Like I said earlier, I liked having the maintenance folks come over. Like the first ever Saudi cross training into our pipeline was a maintenance guy. And he was, he was fantastic. Uh, Lance has been on the podcast and he was a, just a great NCO, very squared away, right? Like, um, you know, needed some of the, the special warfare stuff, but as an NCO was, was a fantastic human. Um, but the most motivated people, and I've said it before, are typically my security forces folks uh, they've got a taste for the the moving and shooting and all that other stuff but they're not able to just keep going the way that they want to go and, and have the control that they want and and, and to do the things that they want to do um so security forces probably has the highest percentage of highly motivated folks that are are willing to do anything to not go back to where they came from yeah yeah and I'm, a- I'm gonna say the same answer but from the other side having security forces on any part of my pipeline was immediately a pain in my ass because either they're <laughs> You know, like there's a lot of highly motivated people in prison too. You know what I mean? Like there's a lot of highly motivated people that are dead at the top of Mount Everest. So just because you're motivated and excited doesn't mean you're fun to have on team. And it's, it's what it was hot or cold. Like our, for cross tradies with us, we had, uh, our PJU motto. So the apprentice course motto on our patch. And I just saw it the other day cause I was going through an old box, but it was no cops, no crows, no lefties, best team ever. <laughs> because we 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 had no cops and no officers we were an all enlisted team and then we had nobody that shot left-handed so when we went to the range it was no cops no crows no lefties best team ever and then the instructors uh, because we were such a terrible team they changed it to no cops no crows no lefties no leadership worst team of all time uh hmm. which we deserved um but yeah so the security force i will agree with trent like when you have somebody that's good they typically have you know, that, that ground mindset that's already there. They already know. I mean, they already spent time in security forces. So, you know, they can deal with suck. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like yeah. Give, give them a Zen, give them a monster. Like they're, you're, you're every day is better than their life standing outside of a guard shack. At that's what I see. The, the crossovers to both pilot, the crossovers and the cross trainings into sensor, the, uh, the cops and the maintainers seem to be happy to be inside of the and they're right <laughs> off the bat. They've got a sunnier disposition. Yeah. Like, it could be worse. We promise it could be worse. So, yeah. <laughs> That's all. Pops, well, we can't say thank you enough, man. Uh, what's, what's up, Trent? Go ahead, bud. I was yeah, just so the, only, the only might be better are the sister service folks, like your dad, coming from that perspective. Yeah. That's true. That's true. Pops, man, thanks so much. We live too close. Let's, uh, let's figure out how to get a beer. Let's figure out how to, for you and me to, to share one of those adult beverages, and I'll get you that shirt we were talking about. But we appreciate you coming on and t- taking us through your whole story. We've had Mustangs on before, you know, people that went enlisted over to, to officer. I think you're probably our first one that ever went from senior NCO. But, you know, to our listeners out there, man, I don't want to hear about your age anymore. I don't want to hear about how long it took you to get there. We, t- we just went over a 15-year career of multiple failures at courses to try to get a degree that's unheard of, just to cross-train to be a first lieutenant at 40 years old and after 15 years in the military. Like, There's not a lot of excuses in there. So, Pops, I appreciate you telling your story. Thanks for, for reaching out and being willing to come on. And 
everybody else out there, train hard. Have a good one. Thanks very much. Have a good one, guys.